Hey, Jim, how you doing? It's Dave here from Real Discussions Podcast for our second season. You're my uh, first interview so far. How's it, uh, how's it going? Rock and roll. Thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, happy New Year to everyone out there. Happy New Year to you, too. So, um, Jim, uh, you and I, I th- man, you know, I was thinking about it. I don't even I just have like known you for about 12 or 13 years. I have no idea when we met and I don't even know if we ever met in person. <laughs> but Jason Casado over at Park Slope Films. Yeah, I know that. Remember but remember the filmmakers coalition we were doing back in like 2010 or that's so. It. We all went out. What was I want to say it was some diner, some really hellhole diner. And it was in New York City. It was the Westway yeah. Diner. Yep. That's mm-hmm. right. That's right. Yep. Yep. And we yep. sat around, I don't know, for like five hours. The waiters hated us. We got burgers and coffee and then talked for the next five hours about everything from Kurosawa to Scorsese and yep. everyone in between. That's right. That's right, man. You know, I because I was saying to myself, damn, I know I know there's the Park Slope connection. And then, you know, but the film coalition was so short lived um, that I mean, I'm still I, I still on Facebook and connected to a couple of the guys from that. Uh, but yeah, that was because that's going back. Jeez, I had to be like what 2008, 2009. I want to say it was 10. OK, because I had just gotten back to New York. OK, in 2010 from L.A. Yeah. And uh, Jason Gasato, I had known we played the Rochester Film Festival together. Mm -hmm. in 07 okay we kept in touch all those you know from 07 to 010 we still talk regularly meet for coffee every now and again that's good um and uh, so when i got back uh i gave him a shout and he told me about the coalition and it was a a good reintroduction into the new york city community because i had been gone for eight years living in la and working there Mm -hmm. um and by the time I had gotten back, a lot of guys had left the industry. Yeah. And some other guys had gotten like massive promotions to the level where they weren't returning our phone calls anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how yeah. that happens. It happens. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, it was a great way to kind of get reacquainted with the community and then uh, and make some new friends and, and kind of uh, launch my or reignite my New York career from yeah. there. Yeah, I'm I'm always amazed. I don't know if you have the same experience, but I'm just the as you go through with your different experiences and your different projects and all this other stuff, you kind of, you know, you amass this group of of people, this community, um, like you were saying, and then you you like, you know, you, you think back, you take a moment and you look back, you know, 12 years later. And you're like, oh, my God, you know, this person, this person. And it's, you know, so many people just from film and so many of them um, have left or stopped, you know, doing doing film. A lot of people that I knew when we started our film company, um, they've left. They've you know, they have kids and family and they're not even thinking about acting or filmmaking or directing or writing or anything anymore. It's, I call it the battle of attrition. Yeah. You know, you're at, at 22, you're fresh out of college where we're living at home. We're back home with the parents. Yeah. You know, we have no, no real bills or responsibilities. Yeah. And then about 25, you're out on your own and now the responsibilities start. Mm-hmm. And then you hit 30 yeah. and there's a drop off. <laughs> and then you hit 35 and then there's another big drop off. So by the time you hit 40, you know, maybe 20% of the guys that you were working with, you know, 15 years ago are still in the business. Yeah. And it just continues to kind of shrink down because, you know, making a living, an earnest living in this business is really difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully the joy uh, and the passion of it all is enough to keep you coming back. For me, yeah. it is, you know, it sure as shit ain't about the money. You know, I get great paying jobs and I get horrendous paying jobs. And it doesn't matter if the if the role is cool. If I'm working with people that I admire, I'm like, all right, let's let's do you like, don't care. Let's make this movie. Let's make this happen. Yeah. Um, and I really, a, a dear friend of mine, a filmmaker who actually had passed on 2019, Lou Pappas, mm-hmm. we did six movies together in the, the years that we were friends and colleagues. Um, and we also used to call it the battle of never enough, mm-hmm. right? Never enough time, never enough money, never enough crew, never enough, never enough of anything. But somehow you and these other 25 maniacs gather in a room, decide you're going to make a movie, 
you have the script to follow as your roadmap, but then, you know, it's a roadmap through a minefield where <laughs> one wrong step blows up the whole thing. Yeah. Somehow you get the movie made and you come back a year later and sit in this darkened theater with the cast and the crew and now their husbands and wives and significant others and then strangers too. And you yeah. get to see what you all did uh, collaboratively as one unit, as one team to make this magic up there. And you look at it and you and, you know, a couple of core players know what the real budget was and you'll keep that secret till you die. But you sit there and you're like, holy shit, looks like a real movie. Looks like we spent some real money on this. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then oh, invariably at the press junkets or Q and A's, there's that question, well, what was the budget? And everyone's like, shut up, don't answer the question. Yeah. You know, let them think, oh yeah, we think we spent $2.8 million on this picture where mm -hmm. you and I know what's what. And yeah. just keep it quiet. It's like, yeah, sure. You want to buy it for 2.8? We'd love to sell it to you. <laughs> That's true. It's There's always that, um, that great moment where uh, we did um, audience testing for the movie we made back, we released in 2016. And um, I, uh, one of the questions was, how much do you think the budget was? And I love the fact that you would come back like 2 million, 3 million, um, all this shit. And, and the thing that I love, now that it's been so long, I don't care anymore. I mean, we made it for $65,000. And the fact that people thought it was, you know, two, two or $3 million, I was just like, no, that's good. Did a good job on that. You know, good, good lighting, good sound, good performances, good, you know, camera moves and structure and everything. And you can sell because really, when you think about it, uh, when I first started thinking about getting involved in directing and filmmaking, as opposed to just the acting stuff, I started really looking at movies and saying to myself, you know, it's really about the movement of the camera and the lighting and the sound. And you need to have the good performances. But I know a lot of actors who will give just as good of a performance as established Hollywood people. Um, so what if we get good actors who are talented and then we follow that process of making sure it doesn't look like crap um, and and really trying to sell the story through the camera um, and through sound design and all that other stuff. And then that's how you can kind of make it, you know, make it happen, which is obviously what you've done as well with with your projects. So um but what so uh, one of the things i wanted to ask you because i'm i'm always drawn to people who uh have decided yeah i'm gonna do the industry stuff and i'll go to auditions and this and that whatever but i also want to make my own work because when we started doing that in 2008 ish um that was like people weren't really doing that uh to the extent that actors are now now a lot of actors they don't all stay with it you have um they're like i want to have my own production team i want to be able to go make my film so what was the thing for you that made you feel like i want to start making my own projects hmm uh it's a good question I, you know what it was okay so i went to i was i was living in la at the time and i went to afi right the film festival which was at the hollywood arc light i want to say this is 2005 2006 and I went to the Schwartz block and I watched a series of really brilliant shorts, like very accomplished, very skilled filmmakers doing very interesting work. And I really hadn't been exposed to the festival circuit that much. At that, at that point in my career, I was still doing a ton of theater. That's how I was paying my bills on equity stages. That's right, good. just way to make your health insurance because equity health insurance is for superior to sex. I probably <laughs> shouldn't say that. We can cut that, right? Uh, <laughs> um, I had done a few movies, but they were job, you know, hires. You know, uh, um, I went, I auditioned, I got the role, I did it, and that was that. Um, but seeing these guys and gals make these incredible films so there was this one film i forget the filmmaker's name but it was it was like david mammoth's gilded stones was the name of the film and it was this short film about making a movie but they kept and they shot it like a mockumentary style 
and then had each sequence as if John Woo directed it, mm. or as if Scorsese had directed it, mm -hmm. right? And with all the tropes and familiar stylizations that those filmmakers actually use. And I mean, the tears are all, it was like hilarious, it was like hilarious action, yeah. right? And I'm like, these guys are incredible. So I walked out of there thinking, listen, if this is really what you want to be doing, you got to get some skin in the game. You need a little bit more control than at that time, if I was getting, you know, a handful of auditions for movies a year, that was a lot. And if you're booking 50%, which is a lot, I was only doing one or two pictures a year. Okay. They needed more control. I'd shot enough indies by then to understand the similarities between uh, the theory of the unities, which is, you know, 17th century playwriting and indie film. The theory of the unities is quite simple. Unity of time, space, and character. Mm -hmm. So the whole story takes place in one location over the course of a weekend with an ensemble. It's Knives Out. It's every drawing room comedy or drama in English literature from, you know, the 1580s to, you know, the 1760s. Um, it's a lot of the theater that we see. So I decided that I wanted to do a film that way, but I couldn't figure out how do you make a one location film interesting? Mm -hmm. Set it as a period piece. That was the one thing that kept me working in LA. Um, I spent a lot of time training in period work, whether yeah. it was you know, the 20s, the 40s, the 60s, the 80s, all very different acting styles. Or if you go back even further, if you're doing you know, Marlowe or Shakespeare or, or any of those guys, it's a very different acting style. When I went out to LA, there weren't that many actors that could do period work. So that, that's where I kept booking jobs. It's like, okay, cool. So I decided to do this as a period. And we did it as uh, a Roman assassination. 12 Angry Men set <laughs> in a Roman tent on the eve of war. Mm -hmm. And they ultimately decide to uh, assassinate the emperor, or Imperator, um, and then cover up the crime and negotiate a deal that puts these noble families in control of the army um, and in control of their destinies, if you will. And these are the families that actually historically did build Rome. They took Rome from a very small city state to the most powerful empire in the world. And it was just a lot of really good actors. Like I had Vic Campos, who was my mentor at the time. He too now is deceased, lovely human being, worked all the way up until about four months before he passed. And he lived wow. 83, you know, he played my dad in a ton of movies mm -hmm. years after that, my father-in-law in another movie, but he'd been in everything from Scarface to Black Sunday. Um, I get Dmitry Dechenko, who's on, you know, Sons of Anarchy and Burn Notice. And, you know, so all these really, Todd Warden, Mark Griffith, Ty Cobb, all these lovely actors that are interesting working character actors. We all trained at the same studio um, to come in. And we shot this over a, a four day weekend uh, with armor from the Warner Brothers lot. We had a friend who works in the wardrobe department. We right. had Richard, we had, we had, uh, we had armor from the original Cleopatra on that job. That's crazy. Right? So the armor <laughs> was older than a lot of the actors on the job. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and we had, but mind you, this is back in the olden times. We shot Indies on Super 16, yeah. right? Yeah. You shot on film. Right? Yeah. You shot super, super low shooting ratios. Like, I mean, we shot the entire movie on a five to one ratio. Wow. Um, but we had a blast doing it. Lots of laughs, lots, lots of practical jokes on the set. Everyone had a blast. The stunts were great. Um, and that was my first foray onto the festival circuit. It did really well. Um, and then we got a distribution deal and ultimately almost 2 million views on this. And this is now 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. So it's before... Amazon, it's before short films were actually treated like anything other than, you know, the, 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 the underling of a feature, right? Yeah, right. Um, and, but it traveled well 
and put me on the festival circuit, which then introduced me to guys like you and Jason and all the other guys just like us that were like, you know what? I'm doing my movies my way. I'm not waiting for permission. Mm -hmm. This is what I love. This is my passion. Yeah. And literally over the next, you know, whatever decade and a half, those festival films always led me to other films. Mm -hmm. You meet someone and what's great about the festival circuit. Um, if it's not a backyard festival where it's like, Oh, I'm going to give my friends awards. Those yeah. festivals are hard. Yeah, they, okay? suck. they should mm -hmm. be shut down. Yeah. But on the real festival circuit where it is competitive, you have a very simple deal you make with all the other artists and craftspeople. I'll see your movie. You see mine. Mm -hmm. That's it. We all need asses in the seats. Yeah. So you go, you keep your word. And ultimately you'll see films. that's like, wow, they're doing some really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And some guys will come and see your movies and like, wow, the work is incredible. And some guys, not so much, mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. find your own, you find your tribe, if you will. Yeah. Um, and it will take years before you actually make a movie with these guys. Yeah. You know, I, met Casado in 08 or 07. He's like, we got to do a movie together. Sure. We <laughs> shot a movie together in 14. Yeah. Or yeah. 13. 2013, yeah. I think. Um, no, it was 12. So five years later, we shoot mm -hmm. a movie together. Um, uh, the movie I just wrapped this summer, I did the producer's first feature 10 years ago. Mm. Right? And now... He's gone on. He did another feature with a lot of big names. There was no room for me there. But then now came down, came back to this ensemble piece that we did this summer, which had a, a mix of big names and then just character actors such as myself. Yeah. Um, so it's really about longevity. You find your people, you support your people. They'll do the same for you. And don't be in a hurry because mm -hmm. things happen. The years fly by, but they happen slowly simultaneously if that makes any sense whatsoever no it does it does you find uh i i'm a big believer in you know making good of your time even if you're not doing what you want to do but it's an essential part of making your movie uh if that's you know raising money or learning about a new way to raise money because i that always is what making your movie or just having a script or a dream in your head the the initiation is always funding do you have funding do you have money um and i'll share a funny story with you uh oh man i don't i think it was in 2016 uh, my wife janine uh had a friend who her husband is ridiculously rich um at least from what we've been told <laughs> so I don't know, he hasn't invested but um he uh somehow the bank had some connection his bank had some connection to liam neeson uh and liam neeson was looking for funding for the irish rep theater so um right. we had just finished our movie uh clandestine that, that we just finally had you know had i literally got the dvds like i think a week or two before so um janine's friend said well why don't you come with me you're going to get to meet liam neeson um because they're looking for investors and give him a copy of the movie and we were like well that's beautiful that's great so she goes and she meets him and of course it, nice he's awesome which is good to hear you know you, you never know with some of these folks um so she starts talking to him she goes oh we did this movie it has tom sizemore in it ironically he was doing a movie with tom sizemore at that point and then he said um that's great that's great he's like where do you get the funding <laughs> so here's liam neeson asking my wife for our $65,000 movie, which looks thankfully like a lot more, but where do you get the funding? And, um, and that's such a huge part of it, but, you know, and it's, I think that's the thing, you know, before we, we started recording, we were talking a bit about, um, you know, uh, the, the attrition, you know, people kind of just disappearing as time goes on. And I think it's the people that just, I just want to direct. I don't want to do all this fundraising or all this like learning about the business of it. I think it becomes just overwhelming and a lot of them just drop out because you spend so many years sometimes in between a project um, trying to get all your resources and everything you need to go make the movie. 
then you're going to shoot the movie in maybe a month, maybe a month and a half, maybe even less, maybe three weeks. Um, and then you're, you know, editing and then the movie's done. And then that, but that took eight years, you know, or that took six years or whatever. So, um, if you want to do it right, you know, cause some, you can, you can rush through it. Like you were kind of indicating before. Um, but that doesn't mean that the movie's going to be good. I mean, that was some of the mistakes that I know I had made in the beginning was I was like, I want us, I want our film company to make a, a movie every year, every year we need to make a new movie. Um, we just need to get it out there. Just get us get ourselves limbered up. Um, and I look back and I look at some of those now and I'm like, ah, maybe it could have been every year and a half, you know, maybe we could have taken a little bit more time on some of these things, but you know, we made any mistakes we made, we kind of made them on screen sometimes. Um, and of course you can, you know, you can edit, but, uh, you go back and you look and you learn, you know, so, but it is a, it is an interesting process. So what I wanted to ask you, as you were speaking before, um, what, 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 as far as having lived in LA for as long as you have, and then coming back to New York, what would you say the, the big difference is between those two uh, areas? Because I've always heard, you know, LA has a stigma, New York has a stigma. Um, you know, everybody in LA has a script and Bruce Willis or someone famous is reading it and wants to be in it. In New York, everybody is just going to tell you, you suck. So what's your experience having okay, been both Okay, those? so all of which is true. All right, so <laughs> here's, 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 my, here's my quick take. I'm going to offend everyone with this, I'm sure. <laughs> L.A. makes you think you are a much better actor than you actually are. Okay. <clears throat> New York will make you believe you are a much worse actor than you actually are, neither of which is true. It's just in here. But L.A. is the pump and New York is the dump. Now, okay. that's great. I love uh, now. What do they what do they do in each of those areas that you think gives that feeling that you're in L.A., you're a better actor than you are and in New York, you're not. What's the what's the attitude okay. you think? So let me just say this. Let me quote my uh, another mentor of mine, a lifetime character actor by the name of Steve Easton. He would always say, kids, optimism is just pessimism and drag. Don't ever forget it. <laughs> right okay. so in la everyone is an eternal optimist okay you can do it we can do it and in new york everyone's a pessimist fuck this fuck you just <laughs> knock it out right <laughs> so that's it and you I, think love that's... It. I i mean i really i love the new york harshness mm -hmm. i hate new york winters mm. um Another thing that I really noticed about big difference when I first got back is in LA, everyone is also Zen on the outside and peaceful. Mm -hmm. and they're raging maniacs on the inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. New York, we're all raging maniacs on the outside, but we're kind of Zen on the inside. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Neither is right, neither is wrong. It's just where we are. Yeah. Um, I love New York more because you can go to a cocktail party and you'll have 15 conversations and you'll be the only actor in the room. Mm. You'll talk with doc neurosurgeons and politicians and bankers and Wall Street traders and art gallery owners and abstract painters. Mm -hmm. LA, it's, it's all the business. Yeah. Everyone is in the business somehow, even your plastic surgeon. Right. Oh, I, I'm a writer too. Here's my script. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, both have a plethora of talent. Don't buy into the myth that actors in LA are bad because some mm -hmm. of the most brilliant actors I've ever met are in LA. Mm -hmm. Not born and raised there. Right. They're from London or Chicago, mm -hmm. Miami or New York or Paris or Rome. They're from Tokyo and Beijing. Mm -hmm. Um. I actually just worked with uh, one of the guys from the Hong Kong Stuntmen's Association, okay. which are like the most, arguably the best stuntmen in the world. Mm -hmm. They do the most crazy things. It's Jackie Chan and the Fat Dragon. They're, that's HKSA. Okay. Um, and, you know, but they come from everywhere. The stunt coordinator I just worked with, you know, he grew up in Queens, but he went mm -hmm. to Hong Kong to make his make his name and he made quite a quite a name for himself out there and now he's a really hot stunt coordinator here in the states mm -hmm. um it's in la everyone's a transplant 
New York most are transplants. It's just what you gravitate towards more. Yeah. The budgets are lower in New York. The pay mm-hmm. is lower in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, but comparatively, there's about a, the same amount of jobs, believe it or not, mm. because there's so many more actors in L.A., so the the inflation of the amount of jobs out there are kind of there's still as many people crowding into the pipeline to get that job yeah um the one thing i wish i would have been taught at a young age that i didn't realize until maybe my mid-30s was um relationships are all that matter yeah your relationships build them feed them nurture them stay loyal to them Mm -hmm. they'll come back they'll help you greatly um but you know unfortunately being you know an american male at 22 to 25 is he's as short-sighted as they come i consider myself amongst them it's like oh right here right now oh god 30 that's a million years away yeah i'll be a gazillionaire by then no right you'll you'll still be (laughs) struggling by then but okay tough guy you know um and if you think about things in five or 10 year or 15 year plans, then anything is achievable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. I mean, my view, when I started acting, uh, I hated everyone in the industry. <laughs> I thought everybody was a poser. Um, I was a big fan of the Harrison Ford gruff, uh, grumpy guy. And um, and I, that was just my attitude. I was like, I'm doing this because I, I can't not do it. I have to act. I have to do this but I don't like what the industry is. I don't like the people, a lot of the people in the industry, there's a lot of like people doing stuff that morally I wouldn't do that I had connections with. And I was like, that's awful. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and if I had become successful at that age, uh, it's probably good that that didn't happen because I think I probably would have partied a bit too much and been with way too many ladies. So you, you kind of, you know, grow. And I think if you grow, um then you will start to learn from those short-sightedness of youth you know where you're you're really propelled by your ego you don't think you are but you are you know there's a lot of ego going on and um i found that as i've gotten older and i started it's funny when we when we founded our our film company in uh, eight uh my attitude was you know um actors are like the the jews in egypt they built the pyramids but they're not respected by casting directors and and production and all that other stuff and that was my experience as an actor at that point in time then i started doing production and my attitude shifted to everybody's on the same team and i don't have any patience for an actor that comes in and expects everything to stop because they've shown up you the lighting people have been here for five hours before you even showed up um you know and i didn't get any sleep last night because i was reviewing footage and your perspective matures and changes um and you start to realize well what are the who are the people i want around me Uh, i want team players i want team player actors i want team player um dps and you know uh, crew and production coordinators uh and everybody you know i want the whole thing to be a group of people who are there for that one purpose that supersedes politics and and uh, issues and everything else is just i want to make a movie i love doing this stuff and i can't explain why i just have to do it um and thankfully you know with my wife um you know she's the same way there's been multiple times we both just thrown our hands up in frustration and said i don't want to do this anymore i can't it's just too frustrating you know um and then like you know four days later you're back you're doing it again you know you're figuring out that we're working the problem and you're deciding uh well what, what what haven't we tried and then you find your new avenue and you start to pursue that and things start to happen and you start to meet new people and you start to connect and you know you say oh okay here we are we're alive again you know the ball's back in play there's motion happening so um how do you how do you deal with those moments of uh just frustration and and because unless you do this you don't understand like anyone, any of any of my friends or acquaintances that I have outside of what we do with film, they don't understand the sheer oppressive nature of hurdles you have to try to overcome. Um, 
you know, they, they have their, whatever their views are about it. How do you handle the hurdles, the challenges, the, you know, you're getting ready to do something and you lose that crew person or you lose that actor or, uh, you know, whatever it is, whatever your, your challenges have been. Well, I, I've got to say marriage is the key to the kingdom. And I know all the young guys watching this are like, shut up, mister. Shut up now. <laughs> My girlfriend's sitting with me, right? Shut up. But really, uh, for me, marriage um, rounded me all out and grounded me in ways that I hadn't even seen. Mm. So for me, my wife is literally the most important aspect of my life across the boards mm -hmm. i'm also lucky like you and janine you know we make movies together she's a production designer mm -hmm. so although her mostly she does big pharma commercials and big big jobs and then i get her to come and do indies with us and she has 10 times more fun and less frustration working with our minimal non-existent budgets than yeah. she does with big pharma and a bunch of clients who stand around video village mm -hmm. having a 45 minute discussion on whether the shirt is too green what other greens do we have literally <laughs> it's, it's insane um and whereas like we're like guys, guys we gotta go on an indie it's like we're well, losing life what are you doing talking yeah talk, talk with the camera rolls right yeah yeah um uh as far as the kind of craziness of all the stuff that happens on set um i again i go to my wife because she used to produce she was a producer over Metro Motion, which was a big commercial production house for many, many years, long before we met. Um, so literally, I will just unload everything without pride, without ego. This is what's going on. How do I make sense of it? Mm -hmm. And then we'll literally sit down. I'll get the espresso machine cooking. <laughs> Uh, and we'll go through like literally an eight ounce cup of espresso shots yeah. and we'll hammer out everything that is bothering me or sometimes when it's her coming to me bothering her and we'll hammer out the problem. Uh, it doesn't get, it's not perfect. The answers aren't always there. Sometimes we got to come back at it 10, 12, 15 times mm -hmm. before it kind of makes itself. But there is a way. Um, and again, I never had that kind of a support system when I was a single guy playing right. the field or when I even had girlfriends, you know, committed monogamous relationships. It just, it wasn't that level of friendship. That's, that's again, the joy of marriage for me is the level of friendship I don't have to put on any airs. Yeah. I have, I spent so much time having to go into a room full of very cold strangers <laughs> and have to impress them so mm -hmm. I can earn this job. It's nice to just kind of like, this is what it is in all its ugliness. Yes. This is what it is. What, help me. And she does. So that I think was the, the major breakthrough because I don't think the frustration ever stops. Um, mm. Oscar Wilde used to say, it is the plight of the artist to be frustrated. And I pray that never changes. Because mm -hmm. out of that frustration, some really good work happens. Yeah. I, I can, I, I'll watch a movie that I was in and my favorite scenes in the movie are always invariably the scenes where everything just went <laughs> and blew up. Yeah. Everything that could have gone wrong did. Yeah. And somehow there's this flesh of humanity and earnest passion and joy and, and conflict and nuance and detail and emotion that's not being pushed or forced. Mm -hmm. It's just happening. It's unfolding right in front of you up on the screen. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, Steve, my mentor, always used to say, listen, you know, I've been doing this, you know, he's in his 70s now. He's been doing it since his 20s. He's worked with literally Spielberg, 
De Palma, Ridley Scott, all the biggest guys, all the biggest A-list shooters have directed him in movies. And he, you know, he's like, the fear never goes away. I'm always afraid this is my last job. Mm-hmm. I'm always afraid now I'm too old. I'm too fat. I'm too bald. No one's going to yeah. hire me. Yeah. But they do. He's just, he just wrapped the, whatever that Tulsa moon or that Scorsese did out in Oklahoma. Okay. okay. A great, great role in that. And DiCaprio and De Niro and all these guys are in it. Yeah. But the, 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 the worry is, am I ever going to work again? It never goes away. The, the frustrations of the inequities of the business mm-hmm. never go away. But when you're on set, creating something that is way bigger than you are. Right. It's because it's the sum is greater than its parts. It's mm-hmm. not me. It's me and you and the other actor and, and camera and sound and lighting and HMU and special effects. And all of us working together to make this one 12 second sequence pop on screen. Yeah. Um, and there for me is where this magic is. Cause I, I at least have the confidence knowing that, Hey, listen, no matter what, we are all here right now in the present to make this work mm-hmm. and we'll do it somehow sometimes yeah. better than others, but you get it done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's what you were saying. It jogged a memory of mine. I, um, uh, I had taken this class. I don't know if you ever met Harry O'Reilly. Did you ever take classes with him? No. So Harry worked, he's still working, uh, but I took classes with him for about two years. Um, and I met some of the business partners through him. A lot of people I collaborated with, we met through Harry's uh, um, school. It was called um, Actors Alliance. So he used to do, because he had so many connections with people in the industry, I won't use their names, I'll tell you later. But um, he could come in and sometimes he would tell us a story before class and you know he would say everybody come in come in you know and um we would go in and he remember him telling us this story once about these two guys and the one guy at one point in time had been bigger than the other name person and he had hired the guy and cast him in a film and the guy had a role and it was you know it was fine um but they didn't like click I guess the way that the name a the original the bigger name to start uh, had hoped they would so then years go by name b becomes just as big if not bigger than name a and they end up both releasing their movies on the same friday of some year in 2000 uh, some some friday in 2006 or whenever it was um and he tells us he goes yeah so i'm talking to my friend who's name a and he is all worked up because he feels that his movie is going to lose out to name B. And he gave name B his big break. Um, and he's stressing that his he could cut into the profits of his movie. Um, and Harry's attitude was like, dude, you have a movie opening nationally. Why don't you just appreciate that? Like, who, but and he's like, it never ends that that feeling of what you're talking about with your friend. You know, you're doing this movie, like, well, this is great, but this, you always have that thought, well, this could be it, you know? Um, and then the opposite is true too, where, you know, you make something and you think this is great, we're on our way. And then you don't make anything for a while, you know, you feel like, so I think most of creative people, uh, especially if you're an actor, you kind of sit there and say, uh, you'd rather err on the side of caution um, uh, that you're not gonna be doing anything again. And then be pleasantly surprised. So, which it sounds like is the case with your friend, where he, you know, seems to keep working with, you know, really big names and, you know, yeah. builds up that resume. And, um, and I just know, you know, having directed people and, and moved more into that, directors want to know that you're not going to fuck up the shoot. You know, you're not going to forget your lines and we're going to have to give you a reading and you're going to give me problems and they don't want it because you know a director knows and you know this yourself you're going to be dealing with a lot of other problems in the shoot during it during a day in the 12 hour 13 hour period and you want to know your actors are ready to go and that your crew's ready to go and everybody's ready to go so any surprises that happen you can you can all field those because you're working together but it's not like someone sitting there and Suddenly they can't remember any of their lines and they can't hit their cue and you know, all this other stuff. So it's, um, 
It is interesting. It is interesting. It's just an interesting field. I continue to be amazed by it as the years have gone on and I've learned more about it um, and gotten involved in areas that I didn't think I was ever going to be involved in, um, you know, as far as uh, funding or technical stuff or whatnot. But it is a um, it is a process, man. <laughs> and it's also, you know, our age has us in this business over a seismic shift. Mm -hmm. Okay, when we first came, graduated college, indie film was just starting to get hot, mm -hmm. right? You remember the indies of the 90s, Sex Lies and Videotape, and yep. She's Gotta Have It, and Clerks, and, mm -hmm. you know, those kind of uh, blood simple, these little, little indies. Brothers McMullen. That, yes, that yep. went on to, yep. I mean, propel what are now all A-list directors, mm -hmm. right? But not only did we go through that, we went through the shift from film to digital, mm -hmm. which is ever changing. Like, you know, three years ago, everything was about the Ari Alexa. Yeah. Not so much anymore. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, the whole distribution and exhibition avenue has changed. Mm -hmm. So, we, through, over the course of our career, have gone through three major shifts in how the industry who had operated pretty much on an even keel in the same manner for 50 straight years with very little change. Yeah. Goes through massive seismic shifts in a 20 year period, mm -hmm. 25 year period. Right. Um, and I think it presents great opportunity, but it for us, but in the same respect, we're forging our own inroads. There is no map to follow, mm -hmm. right? There's no, oh, this is how so-and-so did it. So let me emulate he, him or her or they the way they did it. No, because it's not been done, Yeah, right? There was, yeah. No, there was no Netflix streaming to really deal with a decade ago. Mm -hmm. A decade ago, we were getting Netflix or DVDs in the mail. Do you remember that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in 2008, I mean, this is going to sound really nerdy, but Blockbuster stock was $110 a share. Mm -hmm. Netflix's stock was traded on the gray markets at 53 cents a share. Uh, crazy. Now, we're looking at a 13-year turnaround. Mm -hmm. Netflix's stock is... 600 bucks a share blockbuster doesn't even exist except yeah. one there's one blockbuster left in i in think in canada <laughs> oh in canada maybe. yeah i think okay. it's in canada yeah so it's it's an i think it's a really exciting time to be in this business i i think and even more so and i and please don't misread into this our viewers at home but because of the lockdowns during covid there is a plethora of content that did not get made. Mm -hmm. Now, for the Netflixes, the Amazons, the, the Tubis, the Redboxes, the, the, um, uh, the Voodoos, the, uh, oh God, there's so many of them. The, all the platforms that need content mm -hmm. to drive subscribership, if they're not adding new content, they're not driving new subscribers. Yeah. Which allows, I think, a very brief window for indie filmmakers right here, right now, to sell their shows, mm -hmm. sell their movies. Because those of us who did weather the storm and we were small enough to fly under the radar, legally, mm -hmm. of course, but small enough to fly under the radar to get our indie features made, and posted, now we could sell through to those markets. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting time for these, you know, these couple of years while the industry and the world at large figures out how to deal with this. Yeah. Um, but I know for a fact all the uh, co-conspirators and collaborators that I work with, can't be 
can't stay at home. They need to make movies, whether mm -hmm. it's they're a, a writer, a director, a shooter, a gaffer, you know, a stunt coordinator, and whatever. Yeah. We, we need to do this. It's in the blood. It keeps us vibrant and fun and lively and all of that stuff. I'm, I'm a nightmare if I go, you know, two or three months without shooting a movie. <laughs> just ask my wife i'm a nightmare she's like, get away from me get away from me right yeah. but when i'm when i'm exhausted and waking up at 5 15 every morning to be on set at 6 30 mm -hmm. um i'm happy i am like i'll jump out of bed i'll do my push-ups in the morning have my coffee pop my contacts in brush my teeth and boom, i'm in the yeah. truck and i'm going yeah. to wherever set is i am uh and I'm happy that Jersey overall is doing all they can to bring production into the state. Mm -hmm. um, it's great to see the benefits, the finances roll into the state, but it's also nice to be able to just hop in the truck and drive to work. Yeah. Um, and then drive home and be home in time to have dinner with my family. Yeah. Which is super, I'm a homebody. You know, if I'm if I'm given a chance to go out and party like a rock star yeah. seven days a week or stay home and watch TV with my wife, I'm picking TV with my yeah, wife. Do this. Yeah, no, I'm the same <laughs> way. I'm the same way. We talk about it. We'll say, like, we want to go out and we do this and do that and whatnot. And then it's, you know, it's kind of kind of comfy inside, you know, it's uh, it's nice. And that's that's very different than I, both of us, my wife or I, you know, before we met each other. Um you know, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, it's, it is, it's been very interesting, the whole pandemic and feeling like we're, we're starting to come out of it. Um, and, yeah. you know, we, we wrote, we weren't able to film anything, which was driving me nuts, but um, we did write, uh, what we do, two, two scripts. And then we came up with like three other treatments um, that I'm going to start working on once I get this next movie, you know, on its way. But, um, yeah, it was really, it was a great, you had to, you have to be creative. If you're a creative person, you have to do something in that downtime or it drives you nuts. I just can't sit. I, it, it's my wife and I were talking about it um, a couple of weeks back. We're like, I said, you know, when we have downtime, we're thinking about film and we're thinking about something creative. I don't, what, I wonder what people do who don't have that creative fever. What do they think about in downtime? you know i because I, I don't know i every time there's downtime i'm thinking about something creative to do so it's it's interesting you know i wonder what those folks think about you know when they they have a moment or two you know because for me my time is taken up constantly with i could do this i could do that or that would make an interesting shot or that would be an interesting script or oh when i play this part I, i'm going to add some of that because i think that's interesting you know and um but that, so that's what's going on during all my downtime my my head is still thinking it's still creating basically so um it's a uh, it's a blessing and a curse i think at the same time you know to uh, to have that but i don't know I don't know. Well, we also have a different type of downtime than mm -hmm. like my brothers, you know, we're in and their families, you know, they, their life and schedule is much different. Yeah. I'll work like a maniac for three to four weeks straight, nonstop, 12 to 15 hours a day, one day off a week. That's literally where I sleep all day into mm -hmm. the next call time. Mm -hmm. But then I'll have a month off. Right. And I'll just kind of decompress. Uh, another reason why we love Jersey is the quick trip to Asbury Park. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, we've got to take off. We're going to the beach. You know, yeah. and, and yeah. we'll hang out at, at the pier all day. And we'll go swim and play in the water. And then a long walk on the boardwalk and ice cream. And the whole, yeah. uh, you know, the whole simple tradition of it all. Um, we do a lot of day trips you know long hike or stuff like that uh you know i know my brothers they don't have that time at all mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. even though their kids are adults they're granddads now believe mm -hmm. it or not which okay. cracks me up to hear little ones call my brother's grandpa oh yeah. my god i torture them <laughs> i absolutely torture them because yeah. they're not that much older than i am 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. They had kids super, super duper young. Very young. Um, so it, I think it's different. Um, and that's one of the things that, you know, when we were young and first came into the industry, we were, like we couldn't handle the long bouts of unemployment, mm -hmm. right? You're like, Oh my God, I'm not working I, you know, and you, of course you got a day job to supplement and all of that. But then after a while, you kind of realize like, well, if I'm a little prudent with my money and I invest a little and I don't run around trying to play big shot, then I could weather the storm between movies, you know, and then that, you know, three weeks or a month off, uh, you know, between jobs is not unemployment, but it's like, oh, well, I have some time to work on the house. I have some time to you know, do a little romantic weekend with my wife. We have mm -hmm. time to, although usually it's, oh, check out this great new wallpaper I got, honey. Guess what we're doing <laughs> this weekend? You know, and it's like, right. okay, now I'm wallpapering the bathroom yet again, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> which, which is no different than my brothers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right, no right, right, right. Whatsoever. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. You know, it's an interesting experience doing this and just kind of, making making the dreams happen and still living a normal life while you're while you're doing it you know i'm finding that balance i'm always a big big fan of balance and um you know making uh finding a way to to have that but at the same time uh, you don't want to get too comfortable in the balance because then you're not balanced you know so now you're kind of like getting sitting in the, the chair chilling too much um and like i said I, I i felt like i did that a bit when i was younger uh it'll happen how could they not see the talent you know and then i've gotten to the state now where my attitude is you know now i want to keep it you know i got to keep things happening i got to keep things moving and um you know that restlessness um is i think helpful sometimes you know or a well, lot of times a doubt. Yeah. and look think about this okay the vast majority of people finish their learning after college mm -hmm maybe they'll pick up a hobby or get into some kind of, you know, side hustle or sport athletic activity that they'll dedicate some time to. For us, we are forced to continually learn something new and stretch mm -hmm. out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. There are so many things I read about where I'm reading. I'm like, I really don't want to be reading this. Mm -hmm. but I have to, because yeah. without that, I don't get the job. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm not, I cannot be competitive against the other actors coming up for this role unless I really understand what thrombosis means mm -hmm. it took me mm -hmm. three weeks to learn how to say the damn word now i gotta <laughs> tell you what it means too right? yeah right, right. um <clears throat> it, and that you know i've always been a curious soul so i like i really enjoy that aspect and i'll get into something like really get into it for this movie mm -hmm. most of the time i don't go back to it because it's stuff that i did for the character for the role really don't want to be playing with butterfly knives all day my mm -hmm. neighbors probably think i'm a psychopath as it is you know <laughs> but for the movie it was really cool this guy flipping his butterfly knife okay he's a little bit weird a little a little bit dangerous that's yeah. a cool character um but it's not something i'm going to continue to pursue um because then the next one will come along and say like, oh i've got to learn about private eye protocols or yeah. you know, medical terminology or legal jargon or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, and on your side of the camera, it's no different because you guys have to not only learn about your job, but you're learning about everyone else on set's job mm -hmm. and how to best facilitate them doing their work. Plus you have to, you know, at this level, it's not like we have studio deals. We're like, oh, here's $2.8 million. Go make a movie. It's like, oh, I need $2.8 million. Now, how, well, guess I'm learning about film finance this next six months and teaching yeah. myself how to pitch investors and mm -hmm. how to identify a qualified investor and all of that stuff. Um, yeah, I think it, it will definitely keep us alive and thriving, mm -hmm. um, if not very gray. Because the grays are sprouting everywhere. <laughs> <I know>. It's <laughs> ridiculous, ridiculous, man. 
<laughs> Ridiculous. I call it I call it my Phoenix Gray for the <laughs> eight eight to ten years. What do we have that company for? I think ten years. It started. What side am I on here? I'm looking at my thing. Whatever. I think yeah, right here. And then it just made its way across as the years went by, and uh, I was like, ah, that's my Phoenix Films Gray. I, you know, <laughs> earned every single one of them. But it's uh, yeah, it does. It, you do, you do. But it's um. You can't quit it. It's an addiction. It's like the only addiction I've ever had, uh, probably except my wife. And uh, it's not, you just, it's not possible to, to walk away. So, but um, I want to thank you for hopping on, man. This was awesome to have a, you know, nice, deep, long conversation, uh, you know, for a bunch of strangers to listen to. <laughs> but my but pleasure. I enjoyed it. Let's, uh, let's do it again, whether we film it or not. Let's yeah. keep the conversations rolling. Because I think we've got a, a an ability to kind of poke at each other to in, elicit thoughts, yeah, and absolutely. ideas and kind of reflections, yeah, which is always a good thing for craftspeople to do. I agree. I agree. It's it's important to have a uh, not have an echo chamber around you, but have a a actual um, area that gives you good acoustics and you can hear what you're saying and what other people are saying. And I think nowadays there's a lot of echo chamber. People just kind of want to be with people in their own silos or tribes. Um, but it's good to get that feedback. As long as you know, it's coming from a good source. That's always my thing. You know, um, I want to know the feedback I am, I'm getting is coming from uh, soil that isn't tainted and soil that I would want to eat the fruit from, if that makes any sense. And um, yeah, and that's that that can be tricky. So when you you meet someone who's a solid dude like yourself, that's always a always a pleasure. So I will uh, I'll definitely be chatting with you. I'll be chatting with you a little bit once we we wrap up the podcast here. But um, thanks again, Jim. And um, I'm going to put some information if uh, anyone that watches wants to check out Jim's work and links to any websites or anything else he has. You can go check out this man of, of many faces and talents. Uh, uh, stuff. So thanks again, man. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. I really enjoyed it, Dave. Same here. All right. I'll talk to you. All right. Be well. You too.